A unique abandoned Tudor Gothic mansion and its history, abandoned places Scotland. Today we travel to southern Scotland to explore the ruins of a house, which sits upon a number of earlier sites, located near an area once named for the ancient Celtic goddess Nectona, or the Pure One. The current building is some 200 years old. The known history of this site begins when a William Finneman gave a church to Kelso Abbey. The creation of a barony there may have coincided with the coronation of Scottish King Malcolm IV a few years before the property exchange. It is likely with the creation of this barony came a small wooden castle or tower. Some traces of a ditch and circular platform are still somewhat visible. Whatever the case of its founding, in 1185, Ranulf de Clare was known to own the barony and was allowed to build a chapel inside its court, which was likely surrounded by a palisaded enclosure with various buildings. In the following decades, parts of the barony were given to the bishops of Glasgow, the Templars, and other church groups. Eventually, after 1232, it was granted to a Sir Robert Baird, who built a new structure known as Baird Tower. Afterwards, Baird fell on the wrong side of the struggle between King David II and Edward Balliol and was executed, losing his lands to Sir John Edmonston, from which it passed to the Stuarts of Darnley, who then gave it as a dowry for their daughter's marriage to Somerville of Carnwath in 1390. A much later description of this tower by famed Sir Walter Scott tells of a 20-foot square interior, four-story tall building with a vaulted basement chamber and a removable ladder or drawbridge, cutting off the lower floor from the upper ones. The second story may have been a hall, while the top stories may have been private chambers. By 1489, this tower was given to a son of Lord Somerville named John, who undertook the construction of a new great house that measured some 100 feet by 30 feet and was three stories tall. This was attached by a stair tower to the old tower house and had vaulted ground rooms. John was to later die at the Battle of Flodden in 1513, and his son, John Redbag Somerville, inherited the house. Redbag was an ally of the Earl of Angus and helped him attack the Hamiltons in 1520 in an attempt to capture the baby James V. Angus was married to the widow of James IV, and while he beat the Hamiltons, they lost the struggle, and with it, Redbag lost his lands. The house was then granted to Sir John Hamilton, the bastard, who extended it further, creating a courtyard between the two sections. The new area, called Hamilton's Work, added a 24-room, three-story extension, which was described as ridiculous and dismal. Later, Red Bag was restored to ownership of this house in 1539. During the 1600s, the surrounding lands were sold off, and then the house in 1647. This was due to the mismanagement of the sixth baron, Sir James. It was then sold on to a Sir John Harper, who buying the house found it in great decay and demolished it, building what was known as the Old House. This building ran east to west with small wings on either end, creating a courtyard with a gate. Nearby was a walled garden and orchard. Another extension was made in the 1700s. When Sir John died, a Sir John Lockhart, Lord Castlehill, purchased the house in 1680. His daughter married Sir John Sinclair, who inherited the house as the Sinclair Lockharts. Her son, Sir John, followed as resident but died without heirs, passing it to a George, who also died without heirs in 1764. From here it passed to a Captain James, but sadly the old house burned down in March 1816, eight years after his death, and his son, Sir Robert's ascendancy to the title. The new house of the Sinclair Lockharts, which we explore today, was built around four years later by architect James Gillespie Graham, famed for unique buildings of its type. It stands as a two- to three-story structure with a basement, nine bays of windows, and was built in a Tudor revival style with a heavy church influence. A port cochere at the front was flanked by hexagonal towers, and the whole structure built of yellow sandstone. Ornate carvings and the family crest of a casket, heart, and lock still adorn the stairs and other areas. A newspaper article of the time lovingly describes its arched entrance with great pillars, a wide fireplace, and interior rooms featuring a large lounge with pointed windows, oak roof, and black marble fireplace. Other turret rooms featured large bay windows and a room with paintings of sun rays on its roof, with orange walls and a white marble fireplace. There was also a drawing room, adorned in blue, broken by turret nooks and having a large gilt mirror. Its bedrooms were named after colors such as rainbow, heather, and primrose, with one featuring paintings of butterfly wings. All said some 27 rooms were within the 100 by 50 foot structure. Around the house were orchards of walnut, pear, fig, and chestnut trees. From one of these chestnuts, a tale tells of a mournful bell sound emanating upon the death of a family member. Also present were hothouses, a fine ornamental garden, and stairway terraces. 
The residing Sinclair Lockhart family was notable for its connection to Sir Walter Scott through John Lockhart, who was born at the site in 1794 and married Scott's daughter, becoming his biographer. Following its construction and Sir Robert's death in 1850, it was the residence of another Sir Robert who died in 1899. The 10th Baronet, Sir Grammy Sinclair Lockhart, was notable as being a major general who fought during the Persian Gulf Campaign and Indian Mutiny, a companion of the Order of the Bath and a Justice of the Peace, before dying in 1904. The 11th Baronet, Sir Robert, died in 1918, years after a brief visit, followed by a 12th Baronet named Sir Grammy, who passed away in 1959. During the decades following the general's death, the house was rented by the Craig family, with these baronets living overseas. Falling from ownership of the family by the 1960s, the house was then used as an office and was saved from demolition in 1967 to be stripped down to its bare walls, becoming a medieval banqueting hall and restaurant. In 1980, the house went up for sale with alterations as a hotel for £300,000. However, in 1984, a fire broke out and left the house as a ruin. In the 1990s, the roof finally collapsed. To add insult to injury, the nearby family tomb was mostly destroyed by woodland contractors in the 1990s, and what is left has been vandalized. It was originally built by Major General Sir Grammy Sinclair Lockhart after his marriage to Emily Udney Brebner, a French commoner who could not be buried in the family crypt. Both graves once lay down a bluebell path and featured a marble cross with sword. Let's explore the outside, which is the most notable remnant, being highly ornate and retaining most of the original features. The first site is the Port Cochere, where coaches and later cars would have parked under or near. The most ornate carvings have been removed following its abandonment. The hexagonal towers still stand, flanking the house on all four sides. As we head around the left, unfortunately for us, the local protection society appears. Quite rare for a house, its oversight has been present since it became one of the last surviving examples of Gillespie Graham's church-inspired Tudor Gothic revival houses. With this development and their physical presence, we are limited to exploring the outside. Importantly, however, the exterior has the main architectural features, with the backside of the house the most remarkable. As it heaves into view, the detail of the pinnacles is apparent, as well as the heavy ecclesiastical influence shown in the high church-like windows and spires. Heavy undergrowth almost blocks the view in areas, while a ragged fence that once protected the site is barely present. A sectional collapse has begun, bringing down some of the walls. A further view of the right side shows more potential areas of collapse and missing stones.
Soon, a heavy rain begins to fall, making further recording impossible. We leave the house as it was, hopefully to return at a later date and record the inside before its eventual fall. Decaying more year by year, despite the beneficial eye of its society, its time may well be short for us in this world. While we've been gone for a while, like this house, we still remain with you here. Join us for our continued explorations of history and the abandoned next time as we explore a magically decaying mansion and its storied past of kings. Thank you for watching. For more unique abandoned places and their lost stories, follow us today by subscribing and hitting the bell icon. Until next time.